Well, thanks a lot. That's really a tough act to follow, with a cello and everything. And I thought I'll bring my guitar, but I forgot it. So I guess I'll, I'll talk about energy. So uh, let me just uh, start. I'll talk about a, a new agency called ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, which is only two and a half years old. And it's modeled after DARPA. And if you go back in the history, DARPA was created in 1958 in response to the launch of Sputnik, when it was felt that the US was falling behind the Soviets, and we needed to take some quantum leaps in technology. In the last 50 years, DARPA has delivered with internet, GPS, stealth technology, and many more. So no pressure on us. We're supposed to do that for energy. So let me first pose the challenge in the energy thing. Number one is oil. In the transportation sector, imagine if oil just stopped flowing. Uh, our whole mobility will essentially end. And today, if you look at where the oil comes from, if you go to a gas station and fill up the, your tank and ask the question, where did that drop of oil come from? About 50%, roughly 50% comes from overseas, from some from countries that don't often share our values. And we pay about a billion dollars a day, almost $400 billion a year for that oil. And we started that in the 1940s, importing oil. China started importing oil in the 1990s, and they climbed even faster. They import about 50% of the oil. So we're not the only ones in this boat. India, Germany, Japan, they're all oil importers, and all trying to figure out how to ad address it is a national security problem, it is an economic security problem. So this is where we are living in, the world we're living in, and the world is looking for leadership in this area. Talking about the world, energy is used by people. So let's see where the people are. The people, you can see where the United States, where the people are, but most of the population density, as well as the population growth, is going on elsewhere. It's in Asia, China, India, Malaysia, et cetera. That's where it's going on. So let's turn on the lights and see where the energy is used. So we turn on the lights on the world. This is what it looks like. The United States is bright, and we need to make it brighter in a sustainable way. But there are many parts in the world, parts of the world, where people have not yet turned on the lights. And as their income levels go up, they want to turn on the lights like anyone would. <laughs> to enable them to turn on the right kinds of light is the biggest business opportunity of the 21st century. And there's a global competition to address that need. So speed is of essence. So what do I mean by speed? This is about innovation and speed, because the technologies required to address that need, that global need, affordable, clean energy technologies, those technologies do not exist today, not all of them. So let's talk about innovation and the pace and the speed of innovation. The best way to explain that is what happened in the last 100 years. So let's go back to the last century and see what happened. Electrification, airplanes, nuclear energy, space technology, transistor, integrated circuits, fiber optic wireless communication. This is what changed the world. We cannot imagine a life without these technologies. And all of them happen in the United States. Now imagine all of this happening in the next 20 years for clean energy. That's what we're talking about, because that's the window of opportunity we have because there's a global competition. So what are we doing about it? Well, let's talk about transportation. Oil. This is the most vulnerable part because we have only one fuel for this part, for transportation. And believe it or not, we have about 80 to 90 billion barrels of oil, not offshore in the United States, onshore in the United States, onshore, in our old wells, right here in Pennsylvania, Ohio, except that we need to push it out. And the way to push it out is to use carbon dioxide, believe it or not. Carbon dioxide, if you compress it and push it down in the wells, you get oil out, and there's a lot of oil out there. But believe it or not, we have a shortage of carbon dioxide in the United States. People pay 30 to 40 dollars a ton to buy carbon dioxide to do this, and there's a shortage. We have the largest reserves of coal. You've got to use it. So how do, we, how do we get carbon dioxide? Well, 
The way to do that today is carbon capture from coal-fired power plants. But it's expensive. It's $70 to $80 a ton to do that. And there's a big plant that you take carbon dioxide, mix it with water, it doesn't like to mix, then you take it out away and heat it to 120 degrees Celsius and get it out. That is not the way to do that. So how do we reduce the cost of carbon dioxide to $25 so that the cost is below the price and you've got a business out there? Guess what? You and I are doing carbon dioxide capture in our cells. We're not heating our cells to 120 degrees Celsius. Somehow we can do that. And the reason is there's an enzyme in our body called carbonic anhydrase, which enables it to do that right now. So there's a project, there's a company called Codexis, which is taking this, this enzyme and ruggedizing it so that you can actually use it in a coal-fired power plant and do it. That's the kind of innovation that we need. What else is going on? Well, can we get oil from some other place? The other way to do that is, is photosynthesis, biofuels. We created a program called Petro, Plants Engineered to Replace Oil. So today's plants are sugarcane, corn, cellulose, etc. But these plants were not designed for energy. We're just trying to adapt. So we ask the question, if you start from scratch and design plants to produce oil directly, what would they look like? Here's an amusing one. There's a group out there, a group of scientists and engineers, said that algae makes oil, but algae is costly. It's, you need water. It doesn't grow very well. So why not use the metabolic pathway that produces oil in the algae and put it inside a plant which grows in bad soil, tobacco? If this works out, imagine, if this works out, it's big oil and big tobacco coming together <laughs> and solving the world's problems. You can't get better than this. <laughs> the other way to address transportation is either natural gas, when you found a lot of natural gas, and electrification, electric cars. The problem is, it's just too expensive. And the battery is the problem. It's just too expensive, the range is too short. So we created a program called BEAST. Batteries for electrical energy storage for transportation. And the, and the idea was, let's go for that battery. They'll make the electric cars go for 300 miles, Chicago to St. Louis, on a single charge, and be cheaper, so that it can be sold without subsidies. That's the best way to do it. That battery does not exist anywhere in the world. We said, let's go for that. And here's an example of that. This is a lithium air battery, which is 20 times better than the lithium ion battery that's used today. And if this thing succeeds, Imagine, this will be, we want you to have a beast inside every car, just like you have Intel inside every computer. That's the thing that we are trying to do right now. And there's a lot of success going on in these little labs around the nation. But if we electrify the transportation, the electricity has to come from somewhere. We use our grid today. And here's the thing. If Thomas Edison were alive today, and look at a CD-ROM, he would not recognize it. Look at a computer, would not recognize it. You look at the grid, he said, I can recognize that. Because it hasn't changed much. It is old. You see these wires? They carry about a million volts. And the, the, the voltage that you get in your home outlet is 120. You don't want a million volts in your home. <laughs> the devices that change that voltage are called transformers. These are not the movie. This is real transformers. <laughs> this is what it looks like. It's about 10,000 pound of a substation transformer. We buy most of it from overseas. This is almost the same device that Nikola Tesla made in the 1890s. And if one of these go down, OK, you need a crane to install. And if something goes wrong, there's a backlog of six to nine months. That's where we are today. And these are average age is 42 years old, and the lifetime is 40. So we're beyond the lifetime right now. That's where we are. It's aging. So we said, maybe we could do better. So there's a whole bunch of technology that we are investing in right now and really research to use semiconductors, silicon carbide, to make transistors that can operate not at 60 hertz, but 60 kilohertz. And if that happens, everything shrinks down to 100 pounds. You can fit in a suitcase. And these are not only lighter and cheaper, more reliable, they're smarter. And now if you take this smart device and put it in the grid, what would it look like? Well, this is how we are looking at. Can we create the internet for the grid? And because today, there is no control of where the electricity flows. It just flows like water from the supply to the demand. And so we need to build routers. So we're looking at that right now. There are groups that are building routers, just like Cisco routers that's in the infrastructure of the internet. And the operating system 
the Unix for the grid does not exist. And that's what's going on right now. So let me stop here by saying, folks, this is, this is real. This is not science fiction. This is happening right now. And what you just saw is a glimpse of the future. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.